terrible news came back to Eli. He was so shocked and overwhelmed that he fell backward off the stool from which he rendered judgment, broke his neck, and died. One of his daughters-in-law, married to one of his sons who had been killed in the battle that day, received word about the army and her husband and the ark. And on that same day gave birth to a little baby boy. And she named that boy Ichabod. And in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, Ichabod means the glory is gone. That's a heartwarming little story, huh? You'll want to be sure to catch the rest of Pastor Terry's message in just a moment. But first, we want to thank you for tuning in to the Indian-run Christian Church broadcast with pastor and author Terry Bailey. This broadcast is also produced as a free podcast, which you can find on iTunes or become a subscriber through our website. We'll have more information at the end of the broadcast, but for right now, let's join Pastor Terry as he preaches this insightful message. And again, good morning. We pray for each other as a matter of course. It isn't usually extremely complicated, this business of praying for people. We we're easily able to figure out what it is that we should pray. If one of us is sick, we pray to God that that one will get well, get better. If one of us is experiencing financial difficulty, we pray to God that that one will get some prosperity, some relief. If one of us is down and just blue and depressed... We pray for happiness and joy to descend upon that one. If one of us is embroiled in a bitter controversy of any sort, then we pray for peace to descend upon that situation. So as I say, it isn't all that complicated, but let me give you an interesting question somewhat along the lines of of what I asked the kids. What if you could write out a prayer? Write it out in detail, just the way you wanted it, and we would make copies and hand it out to everyone so that everybody else in the congregation prayed for you the prayer that you wrote for yourself. What would that prayer look like? What would you write that you would want everyone else to pray for you? Would you have everyone pray that you become fabulously wealthy? Would you have everyone pray that your kids stay out of trouble? Would you have everyone pray that you stayed out of trouble? Maybe, as long as you're writing this prayer, no reason why you couldn't have maybe a dozen bullet points that you had everyone pray for you. Maybe you would just go with the four that uh, Benjamin Franklin was so fond of and pray that you would be healthy, wealthy, happy, and wise. Or maybe you could go more along the lines of uh, what Francis of Assisi always asked and have everyone pray that God would grant you patience, humility, and righteousness. For me, I would just say, don't pray that God teaches me patience and humility because I have read the book of Job and I know how that works. But whatever it might be, you get to write the prayer that everyone else will pray on your behalf. What will it be? I ask the question because as it turns out, this is exactly what David did in the psalm that we've read this morning. First half of Psalm 20, and for those who are both attentive and curious, I already know that I left off Psalm 19. We went straight from Psalm 18 to Psalm 20. Uh, I already have a sermon on Psalm 19. I preached that in August of 2010, 
And if I am ever going to fulfill my goal of having a sermon on all 150 psalms, we can't have repeats in this. So Psalm 19, you can go back and look at that on your own. Uh, But the first part of Psalm 20 is a prayer that David wrote for all the people of the nation to pray for him, to approach God for him with these points. The rabbis record that the prayer was used as part of the ceremony on the day that David had the Ark of the Covenant brought back to the city of Jerusalem. Now, for those who don't remember the story, it's kind of important And I'll go over it. If you do remember the story, it probably won't hurt you to hear it again. The Ark of the Covenant was the most sacred object possessed by the nation of Israel. It was a box made of acacia wood, coated in gold, crafted way back in the days of Moses. On the top were the statues of the angels with the wings extending toward the center and a gap between them. On the sides of the box were rings for the insertion of poles so that it could be carried without any human hand touching it because once it was completed, no one was ever supposed to actually touch it again. Inside the box, there was a sealed jar of manna, that stuff that God caused to rain down from heaven to feed the Israelites in their wilderness wandering. Along with the manna, there were the broken pieces of the stone tablets on which God had with his own hand carved the original Ten Commandments, and at least a piece of Aaron's rod that bloomed. These things were inside the Ark of the Covenant. The little space there between the angel's wings is called the mercy seat because that is where God promised that his special presence would dwell. And the ark was kept in the Holy of Holies, a little cubicle in the rearmost portion of the tabernacle, only approached by the high priest and him only on the highest and holiest of occasions when he went before God on behalf of the people. Now, a couple of generations before Psalm 20, before there was a king in Israel back in the days of the judges, the nation experienced a terrible low point. And it began when the sons of Eli, Eli was a priest and the current judge of the nation, it began when his sons became so wicked and unruly and encouraged the nation to follow them in their wickedness and unruliness so that things reached a state where God could no longer bless the Israelites. That was the beginning of the trouble. The Israelites began losing battles with raiding Philistines. And the Philistines, sensing a turn in their fortunes, staged more frequent and larger raids since they had begun to win. And things were going badly, and the sons of Eli decided desperate times called for desperate measures, and they went and they got the ark out of the Holy of Holies, and they had it carried at the head of the army for their next encounter with the Philistines, because they knew this, never in the history of Israel had they lost a battle when the ark was at the head of the army. But you have to see this for what it is. Two leaders who barely believed in God had never humbled their hearts and repented before God, who had no track record of obeying and honoring God and didn't really seem interested in producing such a track record. These two leaders, treating God as kind of a a magic charm that would solve their problems. The army of Israel was crushed. Sons of Eli were killed. And the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, the most sacred object Israel possessed, and took it home with them. When the terrible news came back to Eli, he was so shocked and overwhelmed that he fell backward off the stool from which he rendered judgment, broke his neck, and died. One of his daughters-in-law, married to one of his sons who had been killed in the battle that day, received word about the army and her husband and the ark, and on that same day gave birth to a little baby boy, and she named that boy Ichabod. And in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, Ichabod means 
the glory is gone. That's a heartwarming little story, huh? The other thing we need to know about this is that as bad as things were getting, God was still at work. And among the other things God was doing, the Ark of the Covenant caused trouble for the Philistines. They first took it to their capital city of Ashdod, but the people of Ashdod, first they had some difficulties with the Ark kind of bullying around their uh, their uh, statue of Dagon in their temple where they tried to keep it. And then specific plagues and illnesses fell on them, and the people of Ashdod began to die in large numbers, and they decided upon consideration that the Philistine city of Gath was actually an even better place for this particular trophy of war. And they sent the ark to Gath, but then the same plagues and illnesses fell on the people of Gath, and they began to die in great numbers. And they sent the ark on to the Philistine city of Ekron. And then those plagues and illnesses descended on the people of Ekron. And they put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart pulled by two cows they thought they could spare and give them a good jab with a hard, uh, sharp stick while they were facing the general direction of the border with Israel. Now, it might be interesting to know that before they sent the cows off, they put another box on the cart with the Ark of the Covenant. And that little box that they made contained a peace offering for the God of Israel, whom they reckoned had been afflicting them. The peace offering was made of gold and jewels, crafted into a form meant to express the hope that these plagues and sicknesses which had so afflicted them were going to leave their territory with the ark. It is interesting to me that what they put in the ark was five golden mice and five golden jewel-encrusted hemorrhoids. Go figure. Sometimes, Sometimes I think God has kind of dark sense of humor. But be that as it may, the Philistines thought that there might remain some small, small chance that they had just had a big run of bad luck rather than divine affliction. And so they used this whole thing as a test of sorts. They started the cattle off in the direction of the Israelite border city of Beth Shemesh. And they said to themselves, we're just going to start them and let them go because it's a little ways off to the border. And if the cows go straight across the border to Beth Shemesh, then we'll know the God of the Israelites afflicted us. But if they stop, wander off the road, graze, hang around here, we might take one more try at keeping that ark. The cattle went straight to Beth Shemesh. The Philistines knew they had been afflicted. The Israelite men at Beth Shemesh made a big mistake. They opened the ark, which they knew better than, and looked inside, and God smote them as well. And they sent the thing on to Kirjath Jerim, where it was cared for by a Levite named Eliezer and his sons. But I need you to understand, it was cared for by Eliezer and his sons and then some other people for decades decades, not returned to Jerusalem, not put in the holy place, not approached in ceremonies, not ever used as as a means of getting purification for the people or uniting them with the will of God. It was kind of kept in the backwaters, watched over, but never approached or used. And it stayed that way throughout the reign of King Saul. They were not quite comfortable again with God. They were a little bit afraid of Him, which may have been wise. And they were a little bit afraid of the ark. And they thought maybe such things are just best left alone. And we'll leave it over there. And it became a good spiritual metaphor for the condition of the nation under King Saul. We acknowledge that God exists. He's our God, we guess, but we don't really want him in the middle of our business. So we'll we'll kind of keep God at arm's length. He is, after all, not entirely safe. But when David became king, he was determined that the ark should be returned to Jerusalem because he meant for the nation to desire that God be right there in the midst of them, involved in everything that was important to them. He was pledging when he brought the ark back and when he built the temple to house it. He was pledging to be a different kind of king than Saul had been. 
and pledging that the nation would be a different kind of nation than when it had lived under Saul. No more holding God off at arm's length. We want God right here in the midst of everything important that we do, in a national center of worship established in our capital city. That's where we want God, visible, prominent, in the center. So on this big day, and it was a big day, a big deal, David had this prayer that he wrote. And as part of all the ceremonies that ensued, he had leaders, people all gathered together, and the people would listen as the leaders spoke David's prayer line by line. They would repeat it back line by line. The leaders, then the people. The leaders, then the people. Until the whole prayer had been said. And the prayer consisted of five bullet points that all the people of Israel prayed for David on this day. They were, God, please hear our king when he calls on you in the day of trouble. God, defend our king. God, send out your power from this new national center of worship we have established to strengthen our king. God, remember all the offerings and the sacrifices our king makes to you And finally, God, give our king the desires of his heart and bring all his plans to fruition. The bullet points were followed by proclamations like, Do these things, Lord, and we will joyously wave the flags and banners of our nation in your name. We know, we know that you already are with our king because of the things you have done to this point. And we trust you, God, more than we trust military might, chariots, and horses. And then the final plea, God save the king. Well, as long as you get to write the prayer yourself, right? You know, I noticed the prayer that David wrote for the people to say for him did not include a clause like, and God smite our king if ever he should stray from you. You know, God hedge him in with thorns and spears if he tries to step out of the way. Nothing like that. But I tell you, I think honestly at this point in the game, David never seriously thought such a contingency could arise. In those moments when our love for God and our faith in God reaches the heights and we stand in the clear sunshine of His majesty on top of the mountain, we are not prone to picture the descent into the valley of shadow. And then I'll tell you this, God would later administer discipline to David whether anybody prayed for him to do it or not. But what do we think of David's prayer, especially these these five bullet points? And let me skip right on over what we might think of that prayer for David in his time and in his context and get right to what we might think of this prayer if it were be, to be applied in our time, in our context, to our leaders. That's, that's the question that's interesting to me. God... Hear our leader or leaders when they call on you in the day of trouble. Well, okay. I think even though we live in a republic rather than a monarchy, probably all of us in this room are okay with that. If the day of trouble comes and our leaders call on God, we would probably want God to hear that prayer. Agreed? Oh, everybody's okay with that. God, defend our leader or leaders. Yes? No? Do we want a few qualifications, some fine print there, some provisos? Mm. God, send out your power from this new national center of worship we've established. Okay, never mind. That's not us. God, remember the offerings and the sacrifices our leaders make to you. Good enough, I think, assuming... The leaders make any. 
Point five. God give our leader or leaders the desires of their hearts and bring all their plans to fruition. I see people smiling. A couple of heads shaking. In the early service, Flo was more emphatic. She was sitting over here in the corner. And just like... God. God give our leader or leaders the desires of their heart and bring all their plans to fruition. Holy smokes. Well, I told you. David wrote the prayer for himself. And David would later learn about some of the desires of his heart and why he shouldn't have them. But I'm going to give David this. Back in the day when Saul was the king, even though Saul was not a particularly good king, and even though Saul was horrendously and unjustly cruel to David personally, David always regarded Saul as the king, as the anointed of God under his hand, a tool in God's hand appointed for this time and this purpose, and he would never, ever raise his hand against the king. I'll give David that. And when later the Israelites went into captivity in Babylon... It's easy to figure out Daniel sincerely lifted up pagan, idol-worshipping kings before God, prayed for their health, prayed for their long life, prayed for the extension of their rule. Well, Daniel knew that the whole reason they got shipped off to the captivity in Babylon was because the nation had again followed the path of the sons of Eli and they deserved it. They could no longer be blessed. And so these Pagan, idol-worshipping kings were the tools of God's discipline being exercised upon them and to that extent advancing the plans of the pagan kings was the same thing as advancing the plans of God. Hard as those plans may have been on the Israelites at the moment. And even though it took a few generations, it was one of those pagan kings who, just as God foretold, one of those kings that Daniel prayed for, God prophesied it way in advance that sent the Israelites back home. For what it's worth, it was also one of those pagan kings that Daniel prayed for that threw him in a pit full of lions. But God was able to deal with that. And Daniel did not stop praying for pagan kings just because one of them tried to kill him. And when Paul would later say that kings, emperors, and secular authorities were appointed by God for the purposes of God, Paul did not mean Christian kings, Christian emperors, or Christian secular authorities. There weren't any yet. Paul was talking about pagan Roman authorities when he said all those things, and when in his letters to Timothy he urged all believers to pray for kings and those in authority, he was still talking about those same pagan Romans, even though by this time those leaders were fomenting persecution against the Christians specifically. Paul kind of reckoned that even the persecutions they launched would end up advancing the plans of God, and as it turns out, Paul was right. And we could continue in this vein. Peter agrees with Paul, and there are other examples in both Testaments. What I'm describing for you is a fairly comprehensive, consistent biblical emphasis on the plans of God as they relate to the plans of secular rulers and the attitude that believers should take toward those rulers and their plans. And in light of that, David may have had something going in that prayer of his, even in bullet point number five. Many of us were deeply concerned about the just past national election. Yes? Okay. Many of us were deeply, deeply concerned about it. And maybe some of you were concerned in the way that I was concerned. I said, here's choice A and here's choice B. Okay, where's the good choice? Maybe some of you were concerned in that sense. Maybe some of you were genuinely excited about the candidate who lost or the candidate 
who won the office of president of the United States. I don't know, and I don't criticize you one way or the other. I will tell you this for myself. There is a vast ideological, philosophical, economic, and religious gulf between myself and the man who won. But he won. And he is my president. And there was a fair-sized gulf between me and the guy who lost, too. And it may well be, as many pundits are claiming now, that our nation is changing in such a way that there is going to be an increasing gulf between me and almost everybody. That may be. But I prayed long and earnestly for God's will to be done in this election. Many of you joined me in that prayer. Do we imagine that he did not hear us? Or do we imagine that our times are somehow different from those of Daniel, David, or Paul? Do we believe, for instance, that the 13th chapter of Romans, which would be a good scripture for you to read on your own in this afternoon, do we believe that the 13th chapter of the book of Romans is the inspired word of God? Or do we not? Our situation is on on some levels complicated by the fact that we elected a president and a legislature and indirectly a judiciary, which in theory are co-equal, and among that largish government, there is a pretty fair assortment of plans of the mind and desires of the heart. It's complicated. But I tell you what, it's not so complicated as to confuse the mind of God or so powerful as to thwart his purposes. The frequently less than morally admirable plans and actions of the pagan Babylonians and Romans did not confuse or thwart God. The mistakes that David would make did not confuse, surprise, or thwart God either. The plans and mistakes that our leaders make will prove no different. They may be in the short term, inconvenient for us, a little, or maybe a lot, but they will constitute no barrier to the plans of God. I guess I would say no one has ever occupied the White House that God did not foresee. And whether it is a blessing or discipline at the moment, and in the end we will not be able to draw a distinction between those two propositions. Kings, And national leaders advance the plans of God, who is, after all, still on the throne. I do not say that any of us of any political conviction or stripe should naively trust our leaders, or that we should ever agree with non-biblical, absolutely wrong things, or that we should fail to pursue change by the legal means allowed us. I don't say any of those things. I say only that we should recognize our leaders for what they always are, tools in the hands of the Lord who will accomplish His purposes. And I say, fear not. We will yet wave the banners with joy and sing the victory hymn of the King of Kings. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, and I suppose some in tanks and jets or monuments and proclamations or political parties and ideologies. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. And in his name we will stand. And his will shall be accomplished. Are we his people? That was okay, but we need a little more conviction. Are we his people? 
then when all others have fallen, we shall stand in the name of the Lord our God. His will be done. Let me ask you to bow your heads for just a minute. Father God, we do lift ourselves before you this day. And we do pray that you will be with our leaders. We pray that you will guide them. We pray that you will use them. We pray that you will protect them from the temptations that arise from the enemy of our souls. We pray, God, that at the end of the day, they and we together can praise you and know that your will has been done. And we pray that as your people, we will trust you above all others and all else. And that in your name, and in your name alone, we will stand. And we pray, Father, that if there is anything that renders us not your people, anything that causes us to, as the ancient Israelites did, hold you at arm's length, and push you from the center of our lives and business and thoughts and loves, then I pray that that thing can be eradicated and that we can be wholly yours. And if there are one or numbers among us who need to come to you today for that eradication to become yours, then I pray, Father, that you will give us boldness and peace as we enter into our time of invitation. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to take a moment to thank all of you, our listeners, for setting aside time each week for the Indian Run Christian Church broadcast on this station. You can find out more about the church with a quick visit to our website at www.christforeastcanton.com. On behalf of Pastor Terry and all the folks at Indian Run Christian Church, I pray God's blessing on you and your family.